Thanks so much for joining us today. God wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear about it. Take a moment to send your story to stories at parkerhill.org. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by going to parkerhill.org slash give and choose the giving option that works best for you. Well, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. Welcome, everybody. Hope you're having a great weekend so far, and I'm so glad that you've included Parker Hill in your weekend. Great to be together again with all of you across all three of our Parker Hill campuses here in northeastern Pennsylvania. And if you've been uh, hanging out with us over the past few weeks, you know that we've been making our way through one book of the Bible, and that is the story of Jonah. And I don't know if you've enjoyed this series, but I really have, and this is a fascinating part of the Bible for me, and I think there's so much that we can learn from this story about God's heart and also about ourselves. And uh, today as we wrap up this series, we're going to focus on the fourth and last chapter in the book of Jonah. And if I could give you one word that really summarizes the entire fourth chapter, it would be the word priorities. It's all about priorities. It's about a conflict between Jonah's priorities and God's priorities. And so today, as we bring this series in for a landing, there's a question that I'd like you to wrestle with, a question that all of us need to wrestle with, and it's this question, what are my priorities? What are the things in your life that really matter the most to you? What are the things that you care about, are deeply passionate about the most? What are the things in your life that you give the most time and attention to? But I think there's an even deeper question that we need to ask if we are followers of Christ. If you would describe yourself as a Christian, if you're part of this church, I think we need to ask this question. Do my priorities align with God's priorities? In other words, do I care about the things that God really cares about? Do my concerns mirror the heart of God? Do the things that matter to God really matter to me? And so today, we're going to be talking about priorities. And as I was thinking about priorities, I couldn't help but remember this guy. His name is Rafael Lozano. Uh, He is 45 years old now. He's single, and he's uh, self-employed, so he's got a lot of flexibility in, in his schedule, which is important because he is a man with a mission. His goal in life is to visit every single Starbucks coffee shop on the planet, And he is serious about this. Sometimes he will visit 10 in one day. And what he does, he'll drink at least four ounces of coffee, and he'll take a picture of himself. And uh, he's doing pretty well so far. He's gone to over 14,000 Starbucks around the world, which is pretty impressive, but it's also a little bit discouraging because, see, he started this back in 1997 when there were only 1,500 Starbucks in the world but they're building them so fast that he can't keep up. So even though he's got 14,000 under his belt, he's just a little more than halfway there. That is his priority. That is his goal in life. But he was, he was interviewed in uh, USA Today a few years ago, and he said something that really caught my attention. He said this. He said, every time I reach a Starbucks, I feel like I've accomplished something when actually I've accomplished nothing. And there are so many things in this world So many things in life that we can give our time and attention to that don't really matter all that much, and we can get to the end of a year or the end of a decade or the end of our lives and realize that we have prioritized all the wrong things. And I would suggest to you that the greatest fear in life should not be the fear of failure. I think the greatest fear in life should should be the fear of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter of having the wrong priorities. And so Jonah chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. And I, that this passage of Scripture, it's so fascinating. It's an interesting part of Jonah's story that most people have never heard. But it's also very convicting because, to be honest, I see myself in Jonah. I think there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us because all of us have this tendency to focus on things that really in the long run don't matter all that much to the neglect of things that really will matter forever. So we're going to jump into Jonah chapter 4, but before we do that, I need to back up to Jonah chapter 1 because some of you, you know, haven't been here over the past few weeks, and so if I just jump into chapter 4, it'll be like coming in for the last 20 minutes of a movie, okay? It may not make sense to you. So let me back up. Here's how it begins. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh 
and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And so Jonah was a Jewish prophet. It was his job to give God's message to the people. So he was used to preaching. Uh, The problem is he wasn't used to going to a place like Nineveh. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, Nineveh was uh, about 500 miles northeast in what is today the country of Iraq. In fact, you can go just outside the city of Mosul in Iraq, and you can see the ruins of the ancient city of Nineveh. But Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were the most powerful people in the world at that time, and they were the enemies of the people of Israel. They had inflicted over the years a great deal of harm on the people of Israel. And the Assyrians were not nice people. They were very cruel, very wicked people. They were what we would call today terrorists. In fact, their their, uh, brutality is well documented by historians. And so God comes to Jonah and he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. But that was the last thing that Jonah wanted to do. And so here's what happens next. Instead of going 500 miles to the northeast, he gets on a ship that's bound 2,500 miles in the other direction to Tarshish, which is as far as you could go in those days in terms of commercial shipping routes. He's running in the opposite direction that God called him to go. And so God sends a storm to intercept Jonah as he's running, and the storm gets so bad that the sailors have no choice but to throw him overboard just to get the storm to stop. And so then Jonah is chauffeured back home in the belly of a fish. And that brings us to chapter 2. Chapter 2 begins this way. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And a couple of weeks ago, Dan White kind of walked us through chapter 2. It's just a beautiful, beautiful prayer of confession and repentance. And so Jonah prays, and when Jonah decides to repent, the whale decides to regurgitate, and Jonah finds himself back on dry land with a second chance. Chapter 3, here's how it begins. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah, A second time. How many of you are thankful that God is a God who gives us second chances? He comes to Jonah a second time and says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And so this time Jonah stays on dry land. He goes to the city. He declares the message that God had given him to declare. And an amazing thing happens. A spiritual revival breaks out in the city of Nineveh. There were some things that had happened in history to prepare their hearts for that message. But from the king on down, everyone was calling out to God, turning from their wicked ways. They were praying to him. It was really amazing. And here's where we left off last week at the end of chapter 3. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Now, at this point, You would think that Jonah would be pretty excited about all of this. He's spoken a message, a spiritual revival is is taking place. But the interesting thing is that Jonah is not excited about this at all. And here's where chapter 4 begins. It says, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Like what? He became angry. When you're a prophet, see, your job is to preach with the hope that people will actually listen and respond and turn back to God. And and that's exactly what happened. I mean, thousands of people, you would think he would be excited. I mean, this would be like the Philadelphia Eagles being angry because they finally won the Super Bowl. It makes no sense. But see, here was the problem. It was a problem of priorities. His priorities were different from God's priorities. His heart was out of sync with the heart of God. And this last chapter of Jonah is a picture of how powerful priorities can be. In fact, if I were to summarize the entire fourth chapter in one sentence, I would summarize it this way. If we change our priorities, we can change the world together. And, you know, sometimes we look at the world. We look at how broken it is. We look at the mess of this world. We just wish God would change it. We pray for God to change the world. And yet the way that God always changes the world is by changing it through his people. And so if change is ever going to begin in the world around us, it's got to begin with us. And it begins with us changing our priorities. And so God needed to help Jonah change his priorities. Here's how it goes. Chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased, and he became angry. He was ticked off. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. 
And so we find out why exactly Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He wasn't really afraid of what the Ninevites would do to him. He was afraid of what God would do for them. And we discover that Jonah understood very clearly the heart of God and the character of God. And he goes on to say this in verse 3. He says, I knew. (laughs) I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamities. Like, God, I knew this was true about you. You give people second chances, you relent from sending calamity, you're a God of grace, you're a God of love, and it ticks me off. Because he says, now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Like, what's going on here? Here's what's going on. Jonah was excited about God's grace and compassion when it was coming his way. He was not so excited about God's grace and compassion when it was being given to people that he did not like. I mean, Jonah liked it when God gave him a second chance, didn't like it when God gave his enemies a second chance. See, there's a difference here in priorities. His priority was to see the people of Nineveh written off, to see God destroy them. God's priority was to reach out to them and get them to turn back to him and to forgive them and change them and restore them. It was a difference in priorities. And so here's what, here's what God says to Jonah, this probing question, verse 4. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? In fact, we should read it this way. Jonah, have you any right to be angry? Jonah, how can you be angry at me for sparing them? Are you forget, forgetting how I spared you? Jonah, have you for, completely forgotten where you were for three days? Jonah, you of all people should be thankful that I'm a God of grace and compassion. You see, what happened to Jonah often happens to us, that we forget how much we needed God's mercy when it comes time to extend it to someone else. It's kind of like a a convent I heard about in Southern California. This convent is on a beautiful piece of property surrounded by a wrought iron fence with these stone pillars. And on one of the stone pillars, there's a sign that says this, warning, absolutely no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. No exceptions. The Sisters of Mercy. And you look at that and you just have to chuckle because there's such a disconnect between their message and their identity, between what they're communicating and what they have received, almost as if they had forgotten who they were. That's what happened to Jonah. He'd been given so much mercy from God, and yet he refused to to extend it to anyone else. You see, one of the results of being a follower of Christ, of being a Christian, is that hopefully over time you grow in your faith and you become a better person, uh, morally speaking. Like, over time, you'll have a different set of values, a different set of habits, a different set of standards, and you begin to live and walk and look more and more like Jesus Christ, your, your Savior. And that's a good thing. In fact, the theological word for that is sanctification. But here's the danger of sanctification. Here's the danger of becoming a better person, morally speaking. The danger is this. You forget how much you needed God's grace. And over time, you can become proud, and you can become judgmental, and you can lose a sense of compassion for people who are still far from God like those Ninevites were. And we begin to look at people through eyes of condemnation instead of eyes of grace. So he, he pick up the story in verse 5. Here's what Jonah does. He's really upset. So Jonah, it says, went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a, a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now, this is so interesting because, uh, you know, Jonah could have stayed right there in Nineveh, right? He could have encouraged these people. He could have prayed with them. He could have helped them to understand what their new faith meant. Well, he could have helped them to understand God's heart toward them. But instead, he leaves. He goes and sits down and crosses his arms and really just begins to pout. says he watched to see waited to see what would happen to the city. What what do you think Jonah was hoping for? He was hoping that God would change his mind. Like he was hoping to see some fire fall from heaven. And so Jonah's just kind of, he's sitting there with his arms crossed, he's pouting, he's just getting more and more angry. 
was talking to a, a friend of mine this past week, and, and he knew what I was teaching on this weekend. And so he gave me a, a picture that he had taken at the San Diego Zoo, a picture that he felt was a pretty good representation of Jonah at this point in his life. In fact, he keeps this picture in his Bible to remind him of Jonah. Let me, let me show you the picture. That was, that, was, that was Jonah at this point in the story. That's him. But you know what else I think? I think this is way too often the posture of the church when we look at the world around us. I think sometimes we just step back and we retreat from the world and we look at the world around us and we say, you know what, the world is going to hell in a handbag and so I'm just going to isolate myself from it. I'm not going to try to interact with the world. I'm just going to sit here with my arms crossed in a spirit of condemnation and critique instead of trying to help this world change. See, if we want to change the world, we've got to start by changing our priorities. And so Jonah is sitting here, and he's, he's waiting, he's pouting, just getting more and more angry. And so at this point, God decides to give Jonah an object lesson that he will never forget, an object lesson that will help Jonah look deep inside of himself and understand how wrong his priorities really were. So here's what happens, verse 6. Then the Lord God provided a plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And uh, I, I don't know what kind of plant it was. Uh, I, I'm going to take a guess. Uh, it was a very dry, arid part of the world, and there's a plant that grows very well there. It's called a castor bean plant. It grows about 8 to 10 feet tall, and it has really large leaves that are perfect for shade. But it does, it, it, it does, um, it does wither pretty quickly if it gets injured. So perhaps this was the plant, but more important than the plant, I want you to see Jonah's reaction to the plant. Go back to verse 6. Here's what it says. Then the Lord God provided a plant, made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. Listen to this. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. Do you know that this is the only time in the story of Jonah when he is very happy? And what is he very happy about? Not the fact that God has just used him to do this great thing. Not the fact that there's this revival happening in this pagan city, people who used to be his enemies. No, the thing he's so happy about is a plant. Can I ask you a question? What is it that really makes you happy? I've heard it said that if you want to know the real heart of a person, if you want to know someone's true priorities, all you need to do is ask three questions. What makes you smile? What makes you weep? What makes you angry? What makes you smile? What makes you weep? What makes you angry? Do you know what was making Jonah smile right now? A plant. He was very, very happy about the plant. See, the problem with Jonah was this. The problem with Jonah is that he got outside the fish, but he never got outside of himself. And see, I think the worst place in the world to be trapped is not inside the belly of a fish. The worst place in the world to be trapped is inside yourself and inside your own selfishness. And there are a lot of Christians who get saved from sin but don't really get saved from their selfishness. And so they just go through life seeking the comfort of some kind of shade that they expect God to give to them. Jonah was very happy. Even though God had called him to be a difference maker, he's turned himself into a spectator, and he's watching with glaring eyes, but at least he's happy. But his happiness was very short-lived because, remember, this is, a, this is a divine object lesson that he's involved in, and he doesn't even realize it. So verse 7 goes on to say this, but at dawn the next day, God provided and, and that phrase comes up over and over in the book of Jonah. It's fascinating. Back in chapter 1, it said, God provided a fish. And then we just read that God provided a plant. Now it says God provided a worm. Like everybody knows about Jonah and the whale, this is Jonah and the worm right here. This is chapter 4. It took creatures great and small to help Jonah understand that his priorities were way off. The next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. 
And so he provides a fish, he provides a plant, he provides a worm, and God provides one more thing. It goes on to say this in verse 8, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. It's called a Sirocco wind in that part of the world, a very strong wind that would pick up sand and it would like sandblast your skin. It was miserable. I think God was trying to almost drive Jonah back to the city. It says, the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. I mean, this guy's a drama queen, isn't he? I mean, everything is so dramatic. I am angry enough to die. So, so verse 9, God asks again this, this probing question because here's this guy. He's gone from extremely happy about the plant to like suicidally depressed, but God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the plant, Jonah? And he says, I do. I am angry enough to die. What makes you smile? What makes you weep? What makes you angry? You know, you're, you're in traffic and you blow your stack because the guy in front of you took an extra millionth of a second to hit the accelerator when the light turned green. You're in a restaurant and the food isn't quite right or there's a smudge on the glass and you become so angry at the server. You pull into a parking spot at the shopping center and you get halfway into a spot and somebody left a shopping cart there. And in your brain and in your mind, you're cursing at that, maybe out loud, I don't know. You're angry. What is it that makes you angry? See, anger isn't necessarily wrong. Even Jesus himself became angry. The question is this, do we get angry at the right things? Do you know that every six seconds somewhere in the world, a child under the age of five dies of hunger? Does that ever make you angry? There are over a billion people in the world that don't have access to clean water. Five million people every year die from waterborne diseases. Does that ever make you angry? Every day, about 3,500 people in the United States decide to walk away from church and never go back. Does that ever make you angry? See, we live in a world where most people get angry about things that really don't matter all that much, but don't get angry about things that really do. And if we want to change this world, we have to begin by changing our priorities. And if we as a church, if we as followers of Christ are truly engaged with the heart of God, then we're going to be angry about the things that make him angry. So, at the end of chapter 4, there's this summary statement. And this is like the whole point of the story of Jonah. This is like the, the crescendo that the whole story has been leading to. Listen to verse 10. The Lord said, you have been concerned. Key word right there. You have been concerned about this plant, this vine. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. God says, Jonah, you have been so concerned about this temporary source of comfort. And then it goes on to say this in verse 11. But Nineveh, this great city, has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And that may have just been referring to all the people in Nineveh who were so clueless about life and about God. They're described that way. Or it might have been such a large city that this was referring to the children of the city. 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Jonah, can you at least show some compassion for them? And then it says this, and many cattle as well. Like, I don't even know why that's in there. It's, and don't forget about the cows, Jonah. I, I, I think maybe God was like taking a jab at Jonah. He's like, hey, Jonah, you're, con you're so concerned about nature, your little plant. Well, how about the cows? Can you at least show some compassion for them? And then it ends. I mean, the entire book of the Bible, the entire story ends not with some really cool conclusion wrapped up in a great little bow. It just ends with a question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? It ends with a question because we all need to ask ourselves a question. What is it 
that I am ultimately concerned about. Because here's what God was saying to Jonah. He's saying, Jonah, you're concerned about all the wrong things. You're my child, Jonah. You're a good man. You're a prophet. But Jonah, you don't have my heart. Jonah, you're all concerned about a plant. But do you know what I'm concerned about, Jonah? I'm concerned about a great city. I'm concerned about this generation of people. I'm concerned about Nineveh. I ask you a question. What are we concerned about? Individually and as a church, what are we most concerned about? Are we concerned about the things that God is most concerned about? What are the priorities in your life? What makes you smile? What makes you weep? What makes you angry? And see, my desire for each one of us individually and my desire for us collectively as a church is that we would be increasingly concerned with the things that concern the heart of God that we would not get all caught up in the temporary here today, gone tomorrow, stuff of this world to the exclusion of the things that really matter because we live in a broken world that desperately needs change. And I believe this, let me say it one more time, that if we change our priorities, we together can change the world. And I think the message in Jonah chapter 4 is a powerful message not just for us individually, not just for us as individual followers of Christ, but for us as a church. Because as I've said many times before, we live in a part of the United States where the vast majority of people have given up on church. And increasingly with every generation, more and more people are giving up on God. About eight years ago, there was a cover story in Newsweek magazine. It was entitled, The Decline and Fall of Christian America. Lengthy article, very interesting article. Very depressing article as well. But there was one paragraph in this article that really caught my attention. It said this, not only has the number of Americans who claim no religious affiliation nearly doubled since 1990, the Northeast, formerly the home base of American religion, has emerged as the new stronghold of the religiously unidentified, meaning people who've given up on God and given up on church. And the truth is this, In this part of the country where we live, most churches are slowly dying. And the gravitational pull of every church, the natural tendency of every church is to look inward and to focus on the insiders. By insiders, I mean people who already have it figured out, people who know the deal, people who know the truth. The natural gravitational pull in a broken world is to step back, to cross our arms, and to look at the world through eyes of critique and condemnation rather than a heart of compassion. And I pray that that would never happen to us because I believe that God is saying to us, to the people of Parker Hill Church, here's what I'm concerned about. See, I'm concerned about your coworker, that woman in the office that nobody else talks to but everybody talks about. God would say, here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about your neighbor who's struggling in, the, in life, who's struggling in their marriage, but thinks they have no one to turn to. God would say, I'm, I'm concerned about your family members. He would say, I'm concerned about the next generation. I'm concerned about the cities of northeastern Pennsylvania. That's what I'm concerned about. What are you concerned about? And we just want to be a church here that reflects the heart of God and a church that aligns itself with his priorities and cares about the things that he really cares about. And I believe God has helped us increasingly to move in that direction. I mean, this is why last spring we gave away over 400,000 diapers to to families in financial need because we want to care about the things that God cares about. That's why last summer you guys brought in supplies and we filled over 1,700 backpacks for kids who are going back to school, kids from at-risk families, because we want to be concerned about the things that God is concerned about. And I believe he's concerned that young people have the chance to get a good education in the richest country in the world. That's why this past Christmas you guys gave and gave and gave and we gave away 3,700 brand new winter coats to families that are facing financial challenges because we want to be concerned about the things that God is concerned about and we want people to know that there's a church that cares about them. More importantly, there is a God that cares about them. And that's why over these past two days, we've had 135 middle and high school students who went without food for 30 hours. 
and raised over $22,000 to make a difference in the lives of people that they will never meet. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm thankful for the volunteers and the staff. You can... And we need to applaud for the small group leaders and the staff because they went 30 hours without eating as well and they slept about four, okay? So we appreciate that. And do you know why we do things like that? Because we want to raise in this church a generation of young people who have learned to look beyond themselves and to concern themselves with the things that God is concerned about and to have their priorities aligned with the priorities of God. And I'm so blessed to be a part of a church where stuff like that happens. Because if we want to make a difference in the world, if we want to change the world, it has to begin with changing our priorities. Now, let me give you a very simple way to apply this, very simple thing that you can do over the next five weeks leading up to Easter. I want you to be thinking over this next month about the people that God has placed in your life, people that he is concerned about, and people that he wants us to be concerned about. And one simple way just to show your concern and maybe draw somebody one step closer to the heart of God is just to invite them to come to church with you. We're beginning a new series next week, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. It's called Waiting Room. And and during this series, we're going to be talking about those times in life when you find yourself in a situation that you had not anticipated and a situation that you can do nothing to change. Those times in life when we don't know what the future will hold for us, when we don't know if our lives will ever be back to normal, when we don't know sometimes even if God is there, if God is listening. Those waiting room seasons of life. And I'll bet that there are people in your life who are struggling with those kinds of questions and those kinds of situations. And if you were to reach out to them and invite them to come to church, they might just come with you and they might find the answers that they have been looking for. And so we're going to ask you to take that simple step as a way of showing concern over this next month. But I I want to close with one more um, story, something that happened last summer on the beach in Panama City, Florida. And and I read this article last summer when this happened, but uh, apparently two brothers were out swimming in the water um, just offshore. But as, as they were swimming out there, they got caught in a riptide that started pulling them farther and farther out into the ocean. Their mom saw what was happening, and her maternal instinct instinct kicked in, and, and she ran out and swam out to them to try to save them. She got caught in the riptide as well. And then one by one, other family members saw what was happening, and they tried to help. And eventually, there were seven members of one family out in the ocean, all caught in the riptide, all drifting out to sea. And there was a husband and wife strangers to that family. They were, they were on the beach, and with some quick thinking and quick recruiting, they got a bunch of people to, to link arms together, and they formed a human chain. And eventually, there were 80 people in this human chain. And they reached all the way out to this family that was struggling, and they gave them a hand, and they pulled them back in to shore. And the reason I share that with you is because when I read that story last summer, I thought to myself, That is a picture of what a healthy church looks like. A whole bunch of people who come together, who are willing to leave the comfort of the shore and lock arms together and wade out into the water, not for the sake of themselves, but for the sake of someone out there who just needs a hand, who needs someone to pull them in, who needs someone to answer their questions and show that they care and help them find the way back to God. And if we have the right priorities, if we can change our priorities, I believe that we can change the world. As we wrap up, I want to give you a picture of what this looks like in everyday life. Just a a simple story about two strangers who met one day on a college campus, struck up a spiritual conversation that led to transformation. So watch the story of Scott and Lori with me. It's funny, if if God has a plan for you, he manages to put people and events in front of you. And it's truly up to us to open our eyes and our ears and our minds to that. I live near Clark Summit University and I heard some music in the the background. And I'm thinking, sounds like it's coming from over near the college. 
maybe I'll take a ride over and check it out. So sure enough, I got there and there was this very inspirational Christian concert going on. I saw this lady that I didn't know. Uh, she was kind of lingering near the back and so I went up and introduced myself and that was probably the first time we met. Mm -hmm. I had over the years attended church sporadically. Something was telling me that I just wanted to have that faith grow. I really didn't know how to go about it. I walk my dog all the time over on campus and coincidentally I used to run into Scott all the time and he would yell, hey, how are you? And we'd end up having some really nice faith-based conversations. I knew that Scott had this peaceful sense of happiness within him and I was kind of curious about that and it, it spurred me on to think, well, I wonder where this is coming from and, and how can I achieve that? We, we met a couple times, I know once was at Starbucks and then we went to Tully's for dinner and mm -hmm. uh, just interacting with those questions and sharing my story of what that you know, path to God looked like for me. I was waiting for this one particular event to occur, an epiphany, so to speak. As it turned out, he said that it could happen in many different ways, which is exactly what my situation was because it was over quite an extended period of time and it involved many different people and conversations and events and ultimately we did both reach the same goal. We received the exact same gift, which is God's love. I decided that I wanted to become baptized here at Parker Hill and that to me was a very significant change in my life. And that was an awesome thing. I think it was in the front row probably one of the highlights of, of last year for sure. I ended up attending the starting point class and after that a group of us currently are doing a plan through the Bible app where we are reading the Bible in a year. When I'm just going about day-to-day -day process, you know, run into people and I, I try to express that same feeling and do what what Jesus would want me to do as far as being kind to people, being compassionate to people, helping others. And it is very rewarding and it's all based upon the fact of the presence that I feel to Jesus within me. That kindness and that love has really kind of encouraged me uh, to do the same. And then just to see and to continue to share with, uh, you know, what the love of Christ and the power of God can do um, through anyone in any circumstance and situation of life. So, and I uh, got a great friend out of it. And it's been awesome just to see um, God continue to work and all of that. We believe at the core of who we are that every one matters, every person matters, every heart matters, every story matters. We are here to continue the mission that Jesus began almost 2,000 years ago, to change this world one heart at a time, one person at a time, one soul at a time. See, God loves people who seem to have it all together, and He loves people who can't seem to get a break. God loves firefighters, and He loves farmers. He loves truck drivers, and He loves stockbrokers. God loves politicians, and He loves factory workers. He loves meth dealers, and He loves seminary students. God loves families who are falling apart, and He loves families who are pretending that they have it all together. Because in His eyes, no one is too sinful, too scarred, too screwed up, or too far away. And if we're going to be a church that mirrors the heart of God, then we got to see people around us the way that God sees them.